Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation of electron acceptor selection for enhanced bioremediation of non-chlorinated hydrocarbons. My name is Brad Elkins, I'm with EOS Remediation and I'll be your presenter for today. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of EOS Remediation, we're a small woman-owned firm located in Raleigh, North Carolina. We've been developing and providing in situ remediation technologies for more than a decade. The topic that I'm going to present today is going to be on in situ bioremediation treatment of petroleum hydrocarbons and the title says non-chlorinated hydrocarbons because the methodologies I'm going to explain can be used to treat contaminants that are outside of the range of petroleum hydrocarbons and so I want to encapsulate everything by including them as non-chlorinated hydrocarbons. So what is bioremediation? For those of you who may not be aware Bioremediation is a microbial respiration process whereby a microbe utilizes an electron donor and an electron acceptor and through their microbial process breaks down that contaminant of concern into non-toxic byproducts. The electron donor for the case of this talk will actually be the contaminant of concern, a fuel contaminant such as benzene. If this was a chlorinated solvent case the electron donor would actually be a limiting factor and would need to be something you would add to the system. But for fuel contaminants, it's the electron acceptor that is limited. Here I've listed several very common ones, sulfate, oxygen, nitrate, and iron. And the debate is really for your site, which of these electron acceptors is most appropriate to add to the system to um, promote biodegradation of your contaminants. And so that's what I'm going to cover in these next few slides. So here is a cross-section of a hypothetical aquifer. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play a little animation for you that's going to be an introduction of a contaminant. And this could be a petroleum contaminant from a UST. Once the contamination is introduced into the subsurface, aerobic respiration is going to dominate. And as the plume migrates and ages, the interior of the plume is going to become gradually more and more reducing to a state where it is in methanogenesis. It's important to understand where in this redox ladder your site is. The best way to do that is to collect a sample of groundwater somewhere up gradient of the spill that has historically never had contamination. And then do the same thing in the heart of the plume and maybe even on the leading edge of the plume so that way you can gauge um, the varying redox state of the plume and so that way you can address the contamination with the appropriate electron acceptor. As an example, if your site was in nitrate reducing, adding something like sulfate to the system would not be an effective method, as sulfate reducing state is not uh, the current uh, redox state of the site, and therefore uh, sulfate reducing bacteria would not be active and would not make any use of the sulfate you added to the system. So how much electron acceptor do you need? Wiedemeyer did some great work back in 99 and here I've tabulated uh, some of his results and his theoretical work that he did. The two columns, um, you've got the first column there in the middle that says average mass ratio of electron acceptor to total BTEX. And so here you can just see by taking the complete mineralization of toluene, assuming everything goes to completion and you get the mineralization to carbon dioxide and water, it takes 3.13 mass units to one mass unit of BTEX to get destruction. If you like to work on the inverse of that, that's the second table where we're looking at the mass units of BTEX degraded per mass unit of electron acceptor. And so it would be one mass unit of oxygen degrades 0 0.32 mass units of BTEX. And then this just continues on down looking at an example of nitrate and sulfate. So you can see that you actually need a lot less oxygen to address the contamination as you would for nitrate or sulfate. So how do you apply an electron acceptor to your site? Uh, if you've determined that bioremediation is the best methodology for your site, uh, obviously one of the questions that you're going to have is how do, I, how do I install this material, how do I inject it? I'm going to speak to our two products, EAS, which is our sulfate product, and EOX, which is our oxygen releasing product. EAS actually comes as a ready to inject solution. You do not need to dilute that product. You do not need to mix it with any additional water. 
you would essentially arrive on site and then you would have an injection trailer like that yellow trailer on the photograph. Your drum would be that little uh, drum inside the trailer. That would be your EAS. And you would just hook up a drum pump or some type of pump that could then take that material and introduce it down into an injection location. That injection location could be a temporary monitoring well. It could be a permanent monitoring well. And in some cases, you could also add it to existing SVE piping or to an open excavation prior to backfill. The same thing is true of EOX, except for EOX is supplied as a powder that would need to be diluted with water prior to injection. Common ratios of water to product typically range between 4 to 1 to 10 to 1. But once it's diluted, the injection process is exactly the same. You would pump it out of whatever container you had mixed it with water down into your various lo injection locations. EOX actually has a very um, ideal application for excavations because it is a powder. It can be easily applied to an open excavation prior to backfill. All you would need to do in that case is just hydrate the product before applying your backfill. And that would activate the product and begin the oxygen releasing process. Let's uh, jump into our first case study that shows when you properly assess your site and really take into consideration these electronic scepters and which one is right for your site, you can get site closure and get good results. So the first one here is a former gas station site that was impacted with BTEX. As you can see from the photograph there, the former UST basin is actually now the median of a highway in North Carolina. The geology at this site is typical of Piedmont geology. It's interbedded sands and clays that overlie partially weathered bedrock. And those uh, interbedded sands and clays are very tight material, have a very low hydraulic conductivity. There's an, ac there's an occupied uh, residence 250 feet south of the former UST basin, and this residence operates an irrigation well. Here's the uh, plan view of the extent of the contamination. Now these isobar concentrations here are actually just benzene, um, but you can see here that this generally lays out the footprint of the plume and gives you an idea of the extent of impact. A consultant was hired by the client of this site to do a corrective action plan and evaluate several remediation alternatives to address the contamination here. They looked at EAS, which is our sulfate reducing product. They looked at an ISCO agent and then they also looked at soil vapor extraction and air sparge. There were uh, certain things they looked at uh, but at the end of the day they came up with these conclusions. They saw that they found out that uh, ISCO was going to be the fastest methodology to get site closure. However, because the site is in the middle of a median and there's an occupied residence nearby, there were some health and safety concerns with mixing a strong oxidant on site. And also the oxidants that they were looking at, the reagents themselves, were very expensive. EAS would require multiple injections. However, it took advantage of the prevailing aquifer conditions and was extremely easy to use in the field as it didn't require extra mi mixing tanks, extra water on site. SVE air sparge was calculated to take eight years of operation, but that would be limited extraction due to the heterogeneous nature and tight geology of the site. When you take into account all of the costs, analytical, reporting, implementation, permitting, everything to get the site to closure, ISCO and soil vapor extraction were well over half a million dollars, whereas EAS was right under half a million dollars. And it was because of this um, corrective action plan that the client chose to use EAS. But the consultant wanted to take it one step further in confirming that enhanced sulfate reduction was going to be the right method for the site. So what they did is they collected several samples, both upgradient and within the heart of the plume. They monitored for things like pH, ORP, DO, and most importantly, sulfate. And as you can see from the table here, the upgradient, non-historically contaminated wells had an elevated sulfate compared to wells that were sampled within the plume and within the impacted area, showing that sulfate was depleted and being utilized by sulfate reducing bacteria in the area. Beyond that, they wanted to make sure that they had a sufficient microbial population to support bioremediation during the life of the project. 
And so they sent samples to a lab called Microbial Insights, and they did a census using qPCR. And that was able to give them a concentration of cell population at the site. And you can see from that second bullet on the slide that they had a sulfate reducing population of 10 to the 4 cells per mil. So now let's talk about the actual pilot test. You can see here our map that shows the uh, plan view of the site again. Our isobar concentrations show the footprint of the extent of contamination. And the little blue square in there, that's the pilot study area. Within that, you can see a little blown up uh, window view there that shows the installation of one injection well and three down gradient monitoring wells. Those wells are positioned three, five, and ten feet respectively down gradient from the injection well. This pilot test was done in June of 2012 and post-injection they did four performance monitoring events that were spaced 60 to 90 days apart. They injected only one drum of EAS that's into the PIW1 injection well. They did that at a, a gravity feed method and got half a gallon per minute. Again they did not need to dilute that product or chase it with any additional water and as you can see from the blue uh, little window view there, this shows their radius of influence they got. This is sulfate concentration in parts per million. And you can see that they got 1,000 parts per million of sulfate, 3 feet down gradient from the injection location, and as much as 100 parts per million of sulfate, 5 feet down gradient from the injection well. And they knew somewhere in between uh, PMW2 and PMW3 was going to be the limit of the sulfate uh, concentrations and so they estimated that they got about seven and a half feet radius of influence from that single injection point injecting a single drum of EAS with no additional chase water. I think this speaks very highly to the mobility of the product in a very tight formation that just 55 gallons of material was able to achieve over a five foot radius of influence. So here's the performance data this is after six months of monitoring at the site you can see that the injection well, which is the blue line on the graph, showed very positive results, showing a, a very s dramatic decrease in total BTEX concentrations. The other wells, the performance wells on site, showed little variability in concentration. However, the consultant interpreted this data as a matrix diffusion problem, whereas as they were destroying dissolved contamination, which is clearly what they were doing based on the results from the injection well, they were getting back diffusion of contaminants from the aquifer material back into the dissolve phase. And so it makes it look like the data is not doing very much. But in reality, they're destroying a, a, a large amount of contamination. When they actually went through and calculated based on the raw data, they were getting about 75% destruction of BTEX at the site. This pilot test clearly demonstrated that the right electron acceptor was sulfate and that applying that sulfate electron acceptor stimulated bacteria in the area and they were able to see a decrease of BTEX in the impacted area. Again they saw as much as 75 percent BTEX uh, concentrations degraded within the injection area and because of the results of this project the client wanted to move forward with full-scale implementation and that project will uh, actually happen later in 2014. I will say that this is a pilot study with just one drum and that it would have been a recommendation to continue to add sulfate to this system to promote degradation and keep it going. But because this was just a pilot study, uh, only that single drum was applied. Our second case study is actually going to be a, a gas station site in Taiwan. The geology here is silty sands with a very low K, about one feet per day. The groundwater flow is to the southeast and the water is, in, is encountered at uh, five feet below grade. You can see here on the right hand side of the slide, this is a plan view of the site. Um, the pump islands are going to be those two kind of squares in the middle and up in the upper left hand corner of the map you see the UST um, basin and that's where our contamination is located. They collected soil samples right at the capillary fringe, right at the top of the water table, and they saw that their TPH, GRO, and DRO were fairly elevated. 
And it was really the DRO that was the driving factor to do something about this site because that was measured at being over 2,000 parts per million. And the cleanup standard in Taiwan for DRO contamination is 1,000 parts per million. Again, this is an active gas station, so they had to be careful about the remediation alternative they were going to use. After evaluation, they selected oxygen as the electron acceptor, mainly because of the type of contamination they were dealing with, being diesel-ranged organics. Uh, sulfate or an anaerobic pathway wasn't the preferred methodology. And also, they liked using the EOX material because they could apply it easily via geoprobe direct push points without disrupting the active gas station operation. They did two rounds of injection, one in April and one in September, and at each injection event, they injected at two points, installing one drum of EOX at each point. I believe they diluted the EOX to 10 to 1 uh, prior to injection. You can see here in the two pictures on the right hand side, the injection setup, you see they've just got the little uh, direct push points with their hoses and everything hooked up to it right at the manifold. So that way they're able to inject their EOX slurry and then pull those rods out and um, cover up the hole so it was like they were never even there. So after they did their second injection event, they went out and did a subsequent monitoring event in December of 2009. Uh, on the map here, you can see the locations of both the injection locations, which are going to be the red and blue squares labeled E1 through 4. And then the sampling locations are going to be the yellow and purple uh, dots on the map. Those are going to be S01, SO2 in yellow and then SO1 through SO5 in purple. The analysis they performed on these samples were going to be for TPH, both gasoline ranged and diesel ranged organics, and then they also tested for BTEX just to make sure that there wasn't any new type of contamination that had popped up over time. So here's the results of, the, of that uh, remediation effort. Uh, you can see that the BTEX, which had historically never been detected at the site, um, was still non-detect even after treatment. Um, the real success here is if you look in the right hand side of the graph, you can see that the TPHG, which is the gasoline range, and TPHD, which is the diesel range, both showed non-detect. Now remember that the site started with over 2,000 parts per million of DRO contamination, and that within under a year, of using the correct electron acceptor, in this case oxygen, they were able to not only achieve a non-detect uh, readout on their analytical report, but they also got the site to closure. The site has been closed out. So it was an extremely successful case study in which the appropriate electron acceptor was utilized, appropriately applied, and they got the results they were after. So in closing, let's go over some selection criteria in case you're considering using one of these methods for your site. I think the first thing we need to consider is looking at the type of contamination. This is going to dictate which pathway, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic, is going to be the preferred pathway. If you have polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, if you have diesel-ranged organics, if you have very high carbon chain molecules like creosote, um, an aerobic pathway is really going to be the only way you can go, at least the way the literature is suggesting it now. Um, I know that there's, I think there's some people out there doing work right now that would suggest that in some of these cases an anaerobic pathway could be utilized, but I don't know that there is strong evidence for that at this point. If your contamination is GRO or MTBE or any gasoline-ranged organics, your options are a little more open. You could either go an aerobic or an anaerobic pathway based on the redox state of your site. And that brings me into my second criteria. Knowing where you are on that redox ladder is going to be highly important in selecting the appropriate electron acceptor to address your contamination. Finally, you need to look at your strategy. Are you going to be excavating backfilling a UST? Are you trying to maybe stop or control plume migration from going off site or discharging into a nearby stream, river, or lake? Or are you looking at total source area destruction and you're going to really want to grid off your points and target the source area? And each one of these things is going to be important for which electronic acceptor you apply and how you apply it. Uh, finally, to wrap up everything, 
uh, you're going to want to definitely consider your time frame and your budget. If your site is under a, um, a real estate transaction, maybe your time frames are a little tighter than somebody who just has to do something just to clean the site up, maybe under a voluntary program. Um, and then looking at your budget, uh, you know, what is it going to take to clean this site up? Is that well within the budget of, of your project? Or is your project under maybe some type of state trust fund program? Uh, doing something like this, uh, selecting the right electronic scepter can ensure that you stay within budget. So that will conclude my talk for today. I really appreciate you listening. Hopefully you learned something. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. My contact information is there on the screen. If you'd like more information about EAS or EOX, please visit EOS Remediation's website there on the screen, www.eosremediation.com. Thank you so much and have a great day.